Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, in honor of Halloween, I have a segment about weird words for ghosts. And in honor of the many questions I've received, I have a segment about the origin and use of the phrase quid pro quo. But first, if you listened a couple of days ago, you know that I had the pleasure of interviewing Dave Itzkoff, a New York Times culture reporter and author of Robin, a best-selling biography on Robin Williams. Dave researched Robin's life, work, and upbringing for the biography. And in his new podcast, Dave teams up with Christy Westgard to explore Robin Williams in a whole new light. The podcast is called Knowing Robin Williams. You'll hear never-before-heard interviews from those who worked with Robin and knew him best, like Tom Schulman, the screenwriter of Dead Poet Society, and Barry Levinson, the director of Good Morning Vietnam. And you'll hear from comedians like Gilbert Gottfried and Chris Gethard about how Robin inspired them to push the boundaries of comedy. Listen for a moving portrait of an unforgettable icon. Just search for Knowing Colin Robin Williams on your favorite podcast app. Today is Halloween, the day many people celebrate all things spooky, spectral, and scary. And what's scarier than a ghost? With that in mind, today we're going to talk about all the words we use to describe ghosts. Let's start with one that's also a favorite movie from the 1980s, Poltergeist. This word was borrowed into English from German in the mid-1800s. It's a mashup of the word polter, which means to make a loud noise or to rumble and thud, and the word geist, which also means a ghost or spirit. In other words, a poltergeist is a really noisy ghost, one that's often more interested in annoying its victims than hurting them. A related word is zeitgeist. This refers to the unique flavor of a certain time, like the counterculture mood of the 1960s. The word is another mashup using geist, although here it refers more to a spirit than a ghost, per se. Zeit means time, so geitzeist literally means time spirit. That is, the spirit or mood of a particular era. Let's move on to the word ghoul. I had always thought this was a general word referring to any old ghost, but apparently it's a lot more specific. It comes from the Arabic word ghoul, spelled G-H-U-L. Its root means to seize. And in Muslim countries, a ghoul is an evil spirit that seizes things, specifically human corpses from graves. Then it eats them. I'll never underestimate what a ghoul is again. Irish and Scottish cultures have several interesting words for ghosts. There's the Irish banshee, a female spirit whose wailing sends a warning that death is on the way. It comes from the old Irish benside, meaning a woman of the fairies. The famous cry of this spirit is where we get the phrase howling like a banshee. There's also the Irish fetch, the wraith or double of a living person. It's the equivalent of the German doppelganger. Supposedly, if you see your fetch in the morning, you'll have a long, happy life. If you see it in the evening, death is soon to come. In Scotland, there's the Kelpie, Wraith, and Bogle. All three words are distinctly Scottish but have murky origins. A Kelpie is a water spirit or water demon. They can take on various shapes, but they're said to usually look like a horse. They haunt lakes and rivers, and they like nothing better than to lure people into the water and watch them drown. A wraith is another type of water spirit, but it can also refer to any sort of phantom or ghost. The bogle is a sort of goblin or mischievous fairy. The word may have come from the Welsh word bwg, spelled B-W-G, meaning ghost, bugbear, or hobgoblin. Bogle has spawned lots of related terms since it first appeared in the 1500s. There's boggard and boogeyman, referring to types of goblins or ghosts. There's boggle, meaning to overwhelm with amazement or fright. And there's bogey, a name for enemy planes used in World War II. Next, we'll talk about three words with very old histories. Phantom, apparition, and idolin. Phantom, and the variation phantasm, can be traced all the way back to ancient Greece, to a word that meant visions, dreams, or ghosts. 
Its root, logically enough, meant to make visible. Apparition has a similar root. It comes from the Latin apparere, meaning to appear. The word apparition once meant anything that became visible, but now it means something that becomes unexpectedly visible, like a ghost. It was first seen in print in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, when the ghost of Caesar appears to Brutus late at night. Brutus, how ill this taper burns. Ha! Who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. Speak to me what thou art. Ghost, thy evil spirit, Brutus. (laughs) <laughs> Finally, there's idolin, a mostly obsolete term for a ghost. It comes from a Greek word referring to a specter or phantom. Over time, the word evolved from meaning a ghostly image to meaning a mental image to meaning a material image or statue. It finally became the word idol, referring to the image of a false god in Jewish and Christian teaching. And that wraps up ghosts for today. Happy Halloween, everyone. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Before we get to quid pro quo, today's episode is brought to you by Hallmark Cards. Your mom is one of those people who you can give a Hallmark birthday card and she will notice. For my stepmom, giving and receiving cards is practically her love language. She loves the way a card can express her love and appreciation in a way nothing else can. My dad likes to say they know her name at the Hallmark store. So when it comes time to celebrate a birthday or holiday, a Hallmark card really means the world to her. Nothing says I love you quite like a Hallmark card. Plus, Hallmark has so many cards, I can always find a Hallmark card that sounds like me, or one that I know will remind the recipient of a great memory we have together, one that makes her smile. Give it a try. See what a card can do to make the next birthday the best one yet. Visit hallmark.com grammar to shop a wide variety of birthday cards and use the promo code grammar to get 20% off your card purchase. That's hallmark.com slash grammar and the promo code grammar for 20% off your card purchase. If you've been following American politics for the last month or two, you are practically drowning in the phrase quid pro quo. And lots of people have been asking me about what it means and how to use it. Quid and quo are both Latin pronouns. In the word pro, in the middle of quid pro quo, means for. Latin dictionaries and old school books give multiple meanings for these pronouns, but modern sources agree that the interpretation of the Latin phrase quid pro quo is something for something. Technically, it can mean any kind of exchange or transaction, but these days it usually has a sense of corruption, as in, was there a quid pro quo? Did Squiggly give you those chocolate donuts for an A on that test? It's generally a noun, as in, was there a quid pro quo? But you can also use it as an attributive to modify a noun, as in, it's a quid pro quo issue. Interestingly, the phrase was used in a much more limited way when it first arose in the 16th century. According to Merriam-Webster, it was used when an apothecary substituted one kind of medicine for another, sometimes by accident and sometimes fraudulently on purpose. Sometimes it was fine, close enough, but as Ben Zimmer pointed out in an NPR interview, sometimes it would make people sick, so it wasn't viewed as a good thing even back then. And then within just a few decades, the phrase started being used more generally. Now, you might be wondering why we have two different words for something. Why isn't it quid pro quid or quo pro quo? Well, they aren't two different words exactly. According to the OED, quo is the ablative singular case of quid. Latin has more grammatical cases than English does, and the ablative is one of the ones we don't have. I'm going to keep this as simple as I can. In Latin, the ablative case is often used after prepositions, like after the pro, which means for, in quid pro quo. English does have the subjective and objective case for pronouns, and we use the objective case after prepositions. 
So you can think of the ablative as being kind of like that. I is the subject pronoun, and me is the corresponding object pronoun we'd use after a preposition in a sentence like, that's for me. So quid and quo are just two forms of the same pronoun in Latin, kind of the way I and me are two forms of the same pronoun in English. There's been so much going on that people are starting to talk about multiple quid pro quos. Or is the plural quids pro quo? Or maybe even quids pro quos? First, let's just stipulate that we're not going to use the Latin plural quae pro quibus. That seems ridiculous, and hardly anyone would know what you mean. It's typical to make foreign plurals the English way once they firmly enter our language. It's why we say our teams play in different stadiums around the country instead of different stadia, which would be the Latin plural of stadium. I first checked the AP Stylebook, Chicago Manual of Style, and Merriam-Webster, but none of them addressed how to form the plural. Next, I checked the online BuzzFeed style guide because it often has guidance on words other style guides don't. Like if you hate watch a TV show, hate watch takes a hyphen. But it also failed me on the plural of quid pro quo. As an aside, the main site did, however, have a quiz. Are you a quid, pro, or quo? And the result gives you a link to a real news story about the American political situation. Well played, BuzzFeed. But then I did find some sources. Both the Oxford English Dictionary and Dictionary.com give two options. Quid pro quos and quids pro quo. I prefer quid pro quos because the whole phrase is a noun. I think of it as a unit, so it makes sense to put the plural on the end. That form is also the first of the options listed at both dictionaries, and Garner's Modern English Usage actually says it's the only correct form. You might be wondering why it's different from the plural of attorney general, which is attorneys general. But in that case, general is a modifier of the main noun, attorney, and there aren't any modifiers in quid pro quo. On the more obscure side, I received a question from a listener named Marcello in Brazil who was confused by the phrase to quid for quo. And I saw a similar instance of quo being used as a verb at the end of a Columbia Journalism Review article by Merrill Perlman in the line, Be careful of what you quo for. But these writers are just making jokes. Neither quid nor quo are typically used as verbs. Remember, they're pronouns. I also haven't seen any authority say that the whole phrase, quid pro quo, can be a verb, although I did find multiple tweets that used it that way, because whether you like it or not, we English speakers do like to verb our nouns. If you're going to write that somebody quid pro quo to something, use an apostrophe D at the end of quid pro quo, like you would for the words okayed or I deed. Finally, while researching this segment, I came across a delightful word that I hadn't heard before that seems to come from the same Latin root, quiddity. It's mostly used in philosophy to describe the inherent nature or essence of a person or thing. It's what makes a thing what it is, according to the OED. Thomas Aquinas equated your quiddity with your essence. I'll end with an example. A profile piece on the Poetry Foundation website says Ted Hughes, famous poet and Sylvia Plath's husband, once confessed to the London Times, quote, that he began writing poems in adolescence when it dawned upon him that his earlier passion for hunting animals in his native Yorkshire ended either in the possession of a dead animal or at best a trapped one. He wanted to capture not just live animals, but the aliveness of animals in their natural state, their wildness, their quiddity, the foxness of the fox and the crowness of the crow, unquote. So if you get tired of hearing about quid pro quos, maybe you can ponder the quiddity of everyone involved. Finally, I have a familect story from Jill. Hey, Grammar Girl. My name is Jill, and I'm from Loma Linda, California. Love your show, but I have a family that I'd like to share. Um, 
my mom owned restaurants when I was younger, and my dad had to lug the food all over the place for her because she'd have to deliver something somewhere somehow, or he'd have to deliver food to her to the restaurant to prepare it. So he would call her Mrs. Cook and Lugs, hence she was his Mrs., and so he renamed her Mrs. Cook and Lugs versus her married last name. And she eventually opened a restaurant in San Diego called Mrs. Cook and Lugs. And so that's a family joke that she's the cook and he's the lug, and together they are Mr. and Mrs. Cook and Lugs. Thanks for your show. Bye. Thanks, Jill. If you want to share your family dialect story, the story of a word your family and only your family uses, leave a voicemail at 83-321-4GIRL, and you might hear it on the show. And be sure to tell me the story, because that's always the best part. Also, remember to check out my video course at LinkedIn Learning. People have already bookmarked specific videos from the course about 2,800 times. So find out why people want to go back to these videos again and again. Many of you will be able to get the course free either through LinkedIn Premium at work or lynda.com at your local or university library. So search those sites for Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing to start watching my videos about active voice, parallelism, using adverbs, and more. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me at the home of my podcast network, quickanddirtytips.com, where you can also find all the other great Quick and Dirty Tips podcast hosts, including Nutrition Diva, Money Girl, and the Get Fit Guy. Thanks to my producer, Nathan Sams. And that's all. Thanks for listening.